Bye-bye. Welcome to this session, Tackle the Hassle, which is all about research support. My name is Peter Hinrich from SURF, and uh, today we will have a panel discussion on the topic how to bring uh, research support to the next level. Today we have three guests in the studio from digital competence centers uh, who are experts in the field of research support, and they all brought an example uh, from their own institute with them in the form of a video made by a researcher. So we are going to watch these videos um, and uh, get, get some explanation about uh, them and afterwards we will have a discussion. Uh, I will to want to remind about the yesterday's poll, uh, to the, uh, yesterday in the session HPC, but there was already a conclusion that research support uh, is very important, so today uh, we will dive deeper into that area. But let's, uh, uh, on my uh, right hand, we have uh, Edwin Kallemijn from the University of Amsterdam and the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, yes. Eric van den Berg from Wageningen University and Research Center, and Amir Ibrahimi Vart from the Delft University of Technology. So let's please start the first video from uh, uh, Claudia Kamphuis of the Wageningen University. My name is Claudia Kampuis and I work at Wageningen Livestock Research at Animal Breeding and Genomics. In 2018, we started a new project where we wanted to collect methane data at five Dutch dairy farms. And although we already had experiences in doing this, we wanted to do it differently this time. We wanted to use a new data architecture um, and we had four requirements for this architecture. The first requirement was that it should be able to collect methane data real time. The second requirement was that it should perform a data quality check on the data that would come in real time. The third requirement was that it should be independent from Wi-Fi because the coverage of Wi-Fi is not very well across the entire country. And the fourth requirement was that it should be flexible. And we had two wishes in this respect. The first wish was that it should be flexible with respect to including more farms. And we had the wish to include all the Dutch dairy farms. The second wish with respect to flexibility was that it should be extended to more data streams than just methane. So, we went with the requirements to Wageningen Data Competence Center and together with them and with FBIT, we did develop such a data architecture. And we are now collecting methane data real time from multiple Dutch dairy farms and we are extending it to 100 Dutch dairy farms. It's working, it's working very well. And there is a lot of interest from Wageningen Livestock Research to use such a kind of new data architecture for other projects as well. So, thank you. So, that was an interesting case. Eric, can you explain what you did to support Claudia in her research? Yes, thank you, Peter. Um, Claudia came to us uh, with the requirements uh, she mentioned. So, she really wanted a real-time data platform. Uh, with a lot of sensors that were present in these tables where this, ca where this uh, cattle was kept. Um, and we coupled her with an engineer from the RIT department and we were able to get two solutions running to um, get this uh, use case going. One was transmitting the sensor data over the IoT band, uh, so really being independent of local Wi-Fi, which was really sometimes hard with the Wi-Fi coverage in the different stables. Um, and also the data from all these uh, IoT sensors, uh, joining that together in a uh, IoT hub uh, in, in a cloud solution. Um, so that was really a technology that she had not used before, but that we had experience with, and we were able to, uh, in that way, assist in her research. Hmm. Well, thank you. That sounds very interesting. But before we have any questions, we will first go to the next video, which was from Troy Nachtigal from the University of uh, Amsterdam Applied Sciences.
Hi, I'm Troy Noctegall. I lead the Fashion Research and Technology Group at the Faculty of Creative Industries and Digital Media. We had a very interesting problem in front of us as we were all locked down into COVID. We had a researcher in residency where lots of people were supposed to come to us here in Amsterdam and make some amazing things, but everybody was stuck in countries like uh, the UK and Hungary, and we were all supposed to be working together and had to make a project for virtual fashion. Now, this project was really interesting in the fact that we were really trying to create something dynamic and interesting, but we all needed to work together with some very complex programs to make it. Moreover, we had people co-located all over the place and we were trying to share files and it was fairly disastrous to say the least. Now the project is really dependent upon a lot of interactive technologies alongside machine learning, generative, algorithmic, procedural, and parametric programming, together with a good dose of machine learning that allows for an interactive experience to create a design experience for virtual fashion. But having a space that could support this ML and all the other things together at the same time was really difficult as we were trying to bring these together for instead of making something rendered, making something that was accessible in VR and runtime. So instead of making very highly detailed, wonderful recorded fashion pieces like this with our procedural mathematics, we were trying to make something that people could try on, could design in a real time space and then see it applied to their own bodies. This brought up some major challenges of how do you bring programs like Unity, Houdini, Rhino Grasshopper, the Interactive Machine Learning Library, Maya, Python scripting, and all kinds of other plugins together at the same time. Thanks to the virtual environments team, we found a place to do this. We found a place to bake our machine learning model and to really create something stunning and beautiful that we are putting into Kai and other conferences right now. So thanks a lot to the virtual environments team. You really helped us find a space to come together during COVID times and really create something magical and wonderful. Well, that was another nice example. Uh, Edwin, can you tell what your part was in uh, supporting Troy? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, first, I want to mention that uh, I'm happy to see Troy happy because that meant we tackled the hassle for Troy in this case. Um, and first, we had an interview with Troy uh, to ask him what functional requirements he had. And he was looking for a, a virtual or a workspace uh, where yeah, his, his researchers could collaborate in. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing was uh, extra uh, GPU power, so we can do the crunching. And another thing, of course, the, the necessary uh, applications and plugins he needs to design uh, what you just saw. Um, so we created a virtual research environment. Um, it's all, all uh, cloud-based, um, in which we managed to, to get the, the access uh, in a secure way, so they could access it and collaborate with each other. Um, also, the necessary applications and plug plugins were available. Uh, and of course, the extra GPU power. So uh, the researchers uh, before did it on their laptops. And, and now it, it goes much faster. So he, uh, he could uh, yeah, end his research project much faster. So uh, I think it really helped him. Mm. Well, that, that, that shows, I think. <laughs> but, uh, oh, sounds yeah. as a, gr a great solution. Yeah. Let's go to the third uh, movie. That was from uh, Bart Roth from the Delft Technical University. You too can listen to the sound of satellites. Hi, my name is Bart Roth and I'm an assistant professor at the Space Engineering Department at the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering in the TU Delft. With my students and I, we've built a ground station that is capable of listening to the radio signal of satellites. And by doing that, we can deduce how fast they are flying, in what direction and where they are. Uh, it all started with uh, an idea I had when I was a, a master's student and to see if I could build this ground station with, with components uh, that, that are cheap and, and easy to use. Uh, for example, that we have these USB dongles. We connect to an antenna and we already can record and therefore process the, the, the signal of satellites. Now, on the top of our tallest faculty, the, the AV building, uh, we have several antennas 
connected to radios and software defined radios to record and process uh, satellite uh, signals. Several satellites such as the Delphi C3, the Delphi Next, but also other satellites from university or, or companies. By, by, by this, this ground station, we made a hands-on experience for students to learn difficult processes, difficult mathematics, physics, but by applying this, getting their hands dirty in programming and, and really standing in the field with antennas, uh, students get a grasp of what it is to, to do post-processing. And the prototype has been running for now almost six years, and we are almost confident that the hardware and the software we developed, all done by students and staff of the TU Delft, is now at such a stage that we want to uh, get this open to the public. And I invite you to be a part of this challenge. You too can listen to the sound of satellites. That's interesting, listening to the sounds of satellites. Amir, can you tell what you did to support uh, BART? Sure, Peter. Uh, basically, what, uh, as we saw in the BART video, uh, he set up an infrastructure at the top of an electrical engineering building in uh, TU Delft, and they started recording uh, signals from satellites. But this uh, actually leads to two main challenges here. That uh, Actually, that was the reason that BART came to us. First this uh, data needs to be stored somewhere. The way that they actually uh, store it now is the uh, data goes to a server locally, and whenever the server gets full, they have to copy the data into an external hard drive and uh, like put it somewhere else and uh, like, uh, start recording, start uh, storing the data again. And this process is manual. And the second uh, uh, challenge here is how we can actually make this data available for the public. So here we, we want to tackle these two challenges here. We want to, expand, we want to like replace this, the current storage with like a cloud-based uh, solution in a way that as the data grows, this, uh, the storage also grows. And also uh, provide some way, like a, a, using an API or uh, providing a web service, that can uh, people from out of the university, uh, without having uh, direct access to the server, can uh, have access to the data. Well, thank you, Amir, for this uh, explanation. Now, we uh, saw three very different cases of uh, research and how they were supported. And uh, I can imagine that there are questions from the audience to the supporters about these research projects or about uh, the support. But let me first start uh, a question uh, for Edwin, uh, sorry, uh, for Eric. Um, the poll yesterday confirmed that uh, research support is a, a very uh, important topic. Um, what is, in your opinion, the most challenging part of the research support? Uh, yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, I think the most challenging part is that research is, is innovative by nature. Um, you're always trying to do something new. You're creating new pipelines, new analyses. Um, you're trying to discover new things. So that means that each research use case has usually a very unique set of things that they need to be successful. And that means that um, almost every solution for specific scientific cases is, is going to be one of a kind. Um, so you need to, to have that, that support, that attention for each case um, to, to understand exactly what they need because it's usually not uh, solvable by, by very standard solutions. Okay, so uh, uh, the research support is uh, often uh, uh, a one-off, uh, tailor-made. So let me turn to, to Edwin. Uh, how do you deal with that uh, at uh, the UVA? Yeah, well, with the VRE, it's, it's not one size fits all. It's also during the session yesterday that was mentioned uh, before. Um, but we, we have seen that uh, you can have a few standard VREs, um, and we try to build extra fun functionality uh, with, with new functional requirements. Um, and because it's, there are building blocks uh, in a VRE, it's very easy to add new building blocks. And uh, the ultimate uh, approach or the wish we have, or the, 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 yeah, what we want, is to create a sort of a catalog which becomes bigger and bigger. 
so that a researcher can, can you know, choose his own VRE or build his own VRE. You can click it together uh, and it's, uh, the workspace is, is made automatically. It's, it's almost pure automatically and it's available. And also the access management, he can arrange that himself. So he can invite other people uh, within, uh, for example, the, the university, but also uh, outside the Netherlands. Uh, that's also possible. Um, so yeah, we're, we're building sort of a library with, with diversity of VREs. Uh, so we can help the most, the most of the, the researchers uh, now. So, and of course, there are some yeah, uh, extremes that need to be dealt with uh, separately. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's okay. the way we're going. Uh, okay. Well, um, I have a question for Amir as well. But first, there's a, a question from the audience, uh, and specifically about your fear resolutions. Yeah. So um, what did you use uh, for creating the VRE? Uh, a question from Rogier. Okay. Uh, well, at this time we were using Azure as uh, the cloud path platform, um, but the the yeah the way the code is made for the VRE, uh, you can use it also on Amazon, for example, or the the, the clouds from uh, or the servers from, uh, from Surf. So it's it's does yeah it's it's cloud independable. Um, and with the access management, yeah, we rearranged it. Well, SRAM is just uh, announced, of course, so we're going to use that as well. Um, so those are yeah, the basic things. So yeah, Azure, Azure Storage in this case, because it needed to be fast for the machine learning. Uh, but that's what we uh, we used. Okay. Um, now go to uh, Amir, because I think uh, we, we can go back to the topic of, of, of VREs as possible solutions. But um, the... Uh, the balance between tailor-made solutions and uh, the, 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 the scalability. Can you uh, tell how you look upon that from the TU Delft uh, perspective? Yeah, th thank you, Peter. It's a, it's a very, very important uh, challenge, actually, we are facing. Because on, on one hand, we can provide uh, researchers in the university with tailor-made solutions, so every researcher can uh, submits uh, his or her application and, uh, and and then we have to join the project and work with them for a, for a certain amount of time but on the other hand what we can do is to provide some standard uh, services for for the entire university basically we have these two direction here and each has its own like pros and cons on, on one hand in the like a uh, uh, customized tailor-made approach of course, uh, every researcher can uh, re re reach us out and uh, we can solve and uh, approach their problem. But on the other hand, we, are, we have limited resources. We, the, every researcher uses a particular program language, particular technology, and like a, we are very few people. We are not uh, equipped with all those technologies. The other, on, on the other hand, uh, when we provide a standard services, we can uh, like we can go deep into different technologies. Then we can like uh, provide full support on certain kind of technologies. But on the other hand, we cannot provide like a, a service for a specific request uh, uh, from the researchers. Okay, um, I have a question. I think uh, from Maurits. Uh, I think it's uh, to Edwin. Uh, it's with how many people and for how long did you provide support? Uh, do you also maintain the solution in the long run? And that, uh, that, that, that long run maintenance, that, that might be an interesting one as well. Yeah, uh, no, we, we started with, uh, with pilots last year. Uh, so we had a small team, but we're building it now. So yeah, the, the, the management of the system is, is minimal. So we don't need a lot of people to, to, uh, yeah, to manage this, uh, the theories. Uh, so it's of course development, but it goes on and on. Um, and we want to make the, uh, yeah, the, the user interface, so to speak, as, as easy as possible. So researchers uh, can use it very easily. It's, it's, uh, um, so that's our goal to, to get that. Um, well, and in the future, yeah, uh, because you're using cloud, uh, more and more functionalities are becoming available, which we can use. Um, and if you want to build it within uh, on-premise, uh, well, that's, that costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of extra development. Uh, so that's why we choose for, for cloud uh, solutions in this case. So it's more flexible, it's scalable. Uh, so yeah, and, and the, 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 manage the management of the VREs is minimal. So. 
So. But uh, it's not only about uh, scalability, it's also about uh, user friendliness. And, yes. uh, I, how, how do you think, uh, how do you make sure that your solutions are uh, easy to use and, and user friendly for a large group of users? Uh, well, we, of course, we uh, talk a lot to, <laughs> to our researchers. Uh, and now we're doing a lot of interviews, but when it's getting bigger and you have a lot of researchers, that, that's gonna be going to be difficult. So we're uh, trying now to, to make more uh, yeah, training uh, programs uh, with videos, uh, for example, uh, so that they see how, how we can use, how they can use a VRE. Uh, and especially with the ones I just said that we're building this library. Uh, so it, it, and it, uh, yeah, we say that it's very easy to use and uh, a researcher doesn't have to be technical. Uh, of course, you have the, the, the more technical uh, uh, researchers who want to do everything themselves uh, but on the other hand we have researchers who say yeah, well uh, get me a system I will just want to do my work and then they click can click on what they need and uh, the VRE will automatically build uh, will be, be, be built so that's uh, yeah. so we try to to make the user yeah, experience uh, as best as we can yeah. and Amir is uh, are the VREs also part of your Portfolio, service portfolio for the standard uh, uh, services for, for your researchers? No. Or part, more part of consultancy tra traject? We, we can provide it, but we, we haven't received a request for that. Yeah, that, that that's, that's the thing. Yeah. We, we have received some standard requests, for example, uh, t teaching uh, some groups, like some technology like Git or Python, but uh, not specifically about this. Mm. Maybe then I'll also have a question to Eric uh, about VREs because uh, uh, VREs are sometimes developed for uh, uh, user friendliness and uh, uh, so not long tail users. Do you think it's also a solution for the, the high end users? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I think um, it can be. What we do see is that as the high end users are quite demanding in the sense that they know exactly what they want. And the, the core business of a VRE is, of course, to abstract away a lot of these sort of knobs, you know, that people want to tune to get specifically the analysis that they want or um, the type of compute that they mm -hmm. need. Um, so I think you would you would need to be able to to really uh, 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 yeah uh, tune all the the parameters of your VRE if you want to support that uh, that group of people. Um, so I think it, it could be done, but we, uh, also what Amir, echoing what Amir is saying, like we don't see the demand, especially from that group. They are, usually know what they're doing, they know what they want. So we don't see the demand for VRs uh, as much. It's mostly from, like you say, the, the, the long tail users, users that say, I just want a system. Uh, I just want to, I have my analysis, I know what I want to do, and just give me a system that I can do that on and uh, I'll be on my way. Um, but that's a, that's a very different group. Yeah. Okay. And uh, if you want to build up so uh, a, a catalog with uh, a standard uh, components, uh, what can we do to to, to share this knowledge uh, on a national level or uh, with Surf to, to to make sure that these solutions can be shared and easily uh, reproduced? Well, I, I mean, I think just the basics of licensing and, of course, open source code is is very very important. Um, so. Uh, it, you know, it, making sure that people are able to use the solution that you've written and are able to integrate it perhaps in their own VREs. Um, at the same time, uh, yeah, you could even think of uh, some sort of type of repository where you can, uh, you know, uh, publish these building blocks that you've made in the hope that someone else might be able to use them. Um, yeah, the, uh, yeah, that would be very interesting, I think. Yeah. There is a question from the audience, uh, which may be related to, to this part. Uh, what strategies do you find most useful to communicate with researchers in order to fully understand their challenge before deciding to implement an, op an optimal solution? So communication with researchers, uh, you already said you uh, do interviews with researchers. Um, um, maybe for, for you, Eric. Uh, 
Edwin, sorry. <laughs> okay. I keep mixing you up. Sorry. Yeah, we look a lot. Better. Edwin. <laughs> because you, you already said you did interviews, but uh, yeah. maybe this is a good question for you uh, to answer. Well, of course, you have the interviews, but uh, like Eric just said, uh, we also have other universities who are using or dealing with the same uh, yeah, functional requirements from their researchers. So, uh, of course, the Digital Competence Center is. is in the university or the University of Applied Science, but there's also a DCC for all, the whole of Netherlands. Um, so we can discuss those requirements with all the, the universities. Uh, so that's one. Uh, the other one is, uh, well, especially with the VRE, uh, a lot of researchers don't even know about the existence of a VRE or what they can do with it. So marketing in this case is, is yeah, essential. Uh, because then you can reach more researchers because they, they want to know what is it, can we use it, and how it's going to help me with, with my research uh, project. And then you get more uh, functional requirements because uh, you have a, a bigger yeah, range of, of, of researchers with, with other different uh, requirements. So you can even yeah, you can make a strategy from, well, what, what are the most questions about so that, uh, that you can work on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're working in an, an agile way, um, so it's it's possible to to turn left or right within a few weeks, uh, and not it's it's not a project from from a year or two years, uh, like the old old thinking, yeah. so to speak. So we can uh, be very flexible and dynamic uh, in those cases, Just because the world constantly changes. Well, we see it with COVID. Uh, we need a vaccine very fast. Uh, so yeah, compute power is is. Uh, is very important, but also to collaborate with, with other researchers uh, inside and outside the Netherlands, of course. Uh, that is made possible through a VRE, for example. So, uh, I, I think in terms of communication, it's also very important um, to have this sort of catalog, because if people, if you can show, if you're able to show to people what they can do, then yeah. suddenly they can design different experiments, yeah. right? If they know that there's uh, uh, that is very easy to train an AI model to, to classify images, then all of a sudden they can think of their own subjects uh, and the images that they have of them, and they, they, they can have this, you can have this creativity going. So I think um, in communication it's also very important to show um, what you have, what you can do as, a, as sort of an inspirational thing um, and not just ask the researcher, okay, what do you want to do? Um, I think it should really go both ways. Yeah, great. Oh, so um, uh, there is another question. Maybe I, I will go first. To, uh, another, first, before you go to the chat uh, question, I have another question for you, uh, Eric. Um, and that was about uh, communicating with researchers. And uh, how do you make sure that the researchers know the solutions that you have? Because some of them come to you with a, uh, a request or yeah. requirements, but. Um, how do the researchers know that you have these solutions? I, I think, uh, yeah, the, uh, the only way to do that is to try and reach them in the channels that they read. So we have several uh, options within the university. We have internet channels, uh, we have mailing lists, uh, we have, of course, our own data competence center website where we present the different things that we do. Um, it's very hard because there's so many things available and you don't want to be very exhaustive and have this massive uh, uh, overview where people can't find it. At the same time, you do want to present some uh, ideas for solutions because it can help people also think. Um, so it, it, it's, 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 it's tricky to strike that balance, but I think the most important thing is also trying to reach people in the channels that they are in, and that can be very different for different scientists. So also domain-specific mailing lists can be interested in that sense or um, uh, yeah, other channels. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. Is, is this something you, you also do, uh, Amir? Yeah, actually, uh, s similarly, we also use uh, like mailing lists, uh, like poster, flyers, all these kind of things. But uh, one thing that we specifically do in TUDEL is using uh, like uh, our data stewards, actually. Data stewards in each faculty are uh, like a first line of communication, basically, for, for us, basically, because they know professors, they know they know research groups, and they can uh, go to them and tell them, yeah, you, uh, you, you had this problem, and now this, is, this center just uh, started working in TUDEF, and you can submit your request. Yeah, uh, but it, it works like a word of mouth, basically, and it, wor it, it works very effectively. Okay, 
uh, and these data stewards who were reside in, in, in faculties, uh, uh, how, how do they tackle, uh, for instance, complex IT uh, problems? Uh, how uh, uh, basically, data stewards are like each faculty has a data steward, mm -hmm. and data steward try to uh, fix like a uh, relatively small to, to uh, large problem of their researchers because uh, they are they, they are technically competent for, for, with all these technologies. But if the project is a bit bigger, then it will be submitted to uh, DCC as a, like an application to DCC. So. The, the DCC is a kind of the, the uh, over, overlooking or, uh, part of the uh, organization with uh, data stewards placed in the faculties as the first contact with uh, the researchers. Okay. Um, may, maybe still now the Chris is waiting probably for his answer <laughs> and it's still about the, the, the service portfolio we just uh, discussed about. Is there any SLA concerning the services provided by the service support desk? or depending about the service, and is it negotiate, negotiable? So but in other words, um, how do you deliver your services as is, or with SLAs, or service descriptions? Um, well, the first thing we, we uh, focused on was the, the, the technique, the IT, um, and now we're focusing on the service around it, because that's also very important. So how can a researcher request a VRA, for example, uh, where can he uh, ask his questions, is he going to call the service desk or is there another desk available? Um, so that we're implementing that uh, right now. And of course then uh, an SLA uh, is, is becoming uh, yeah, necessary. Uh, and also researchers want to know yeah, what are we going to get? So a service uh, description uh, needs to be made. So that's, that are all the things we're working on right now. Uh, to make it a formal service, a VRE service within uh, the university. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing right now. And the, the, the biggest uh, well, uh, uh, problem or problem, it's, it's always about the money. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, we don't want to make the service too expensive because then the researchers won't use it. Um, and they're going to use uh, well, things that are not secure enough, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's a discussion uh, we still have to, uh, to do with, with all the faculties within our universities, but I think it's also very uh, nice to know if, if other universities have, have, have the same problems and how, they, how are they dealing with that. Um, because that's something uh, yeah, that takes a lot of time right now. And we want to help the researchers, and of course it costs money, um, but how are we going to yeah, uh, sell it, and, and the researchers don't have a lot of money uh, most of the time for IT uh, solutions. So how can uh, we're going to deal with that? Um, so I think also okay, in, in the management uh, of the universities, this is a discussion uh, point. I think. Yeah. If 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 uh, uh, there's a trade-off between costs and a high service level, yeah. um, do you think that there is a difference in the demands? Uh, with respect to service levels mm -hmm. for researchers or for for in the standard commercial companies or standard IT uh, services? Yes, I think so. We already mm -hmm. see it in the, the, the research and education mm -hmm. part, of course, within our organization. Um, so yeah, I think think that's that's different. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if you are. Experiencing the same problems, or, or no, there, there are some solutions, uh, like a, of course, like a commercial solution, but we, we prefer to not uh, use them uh, for two reasons. Of course, mm -hmm. re re researchers prefer to not uh, spend their money on the, some solution that there is a, a free alternative, and also they do not want to depend on commercial closed source technologies. Mm -hmm. that, that's the other uh, reason okay. they always want to use uh, you, you, like a you, open source technology or university technology, something yeah, not commercial. Okay, so what, what I meant uh, a, a, bit, a bit different, uh, if the demands for a researcher with respect to uh, uh, service level, if it's different than an ordinary user using it for, for non-research purposes. Uh, so because uh, at, uh, I think at SURF, but also you as IT departments, DCCs, are faced with the discussion about service levels. Uh, but it may be different than in normal IT settings. Um, I think I think in the 
especially when you're still developing a certain service, when a researcher comes to you in the beginning with a certain question, they, uh, it's actually a benefit for them if there's not an SLA because you're still trying to fine tune between their requirements and what you can deliver. Um, I think though, um, so in that first sort of experimental phase, I think it's, it's useful if you have services that you, can, that you cannot offer as an SLA, but that you can still offer as a as part of a best effort or something like that, um, because it allows people to experiment with new things. Um, and, but at the same time, um, once things start becoming more and more important for a certain research group for their research, then things start becoming dependent and uh, you, know, you need to start talking about an SLA. And I think finding there that cutoff is, is, um, is one of the challenges that we, that we, that we deal with a lot. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well thank you. Now maybe we have a bridge to uh, uh, one of the questions in the chat and it's from uh, Maria Heine. Uh, VRE caters also for security ethical requirements when you work with students and external groups. How do you handle that at Delft and or Wageningen? Probably uh, in Amsterdam it's, it's the same, but uh, when you have to deal with security uh, regulations, then SLAs suddenly become important. So how, how do you deal with that? So we classify systems. Um, we have a, uh, a, a whitelist procedure, meaning that uh, all the services that are used for certain types of data are vetted by our security team. Um, and that includes uh, all the solutions for, for research. Um, I think ethical concerns is, is more difficult because obviously that's also very domain specific. Um, so we, uh, we do have uh, some efforts toward that, but I also don't think that a, a virtual research environment is going to solve your ethical problems just because it has uh, standardized uh, analyses. Um, because uh, again, I think especially uh, ethics is, is very domain specific. Um, yeah, so uh, that's how we do that, yeah. Yeah, and uh, in, in Delft, uh, is it the same there or? Yeah, more or less, it, it, it really depends. It, it depends on, it, it's a research group uh, level issue, it's a university level issue, it's a country level issue. You know, uh, for example, in Delft, we have this like an ethical board and uh, whenever the data has some ethical issue, the data needs to get approval from the ethical board. Uh, but also, at, at the same time, the data should not have any conflict with, for example, GDPR rules or some other like uh, broad uh, rules and regulation. Yeah, but it, it really depends on the case, as yeah, Eric said. Okay, and um, if you, we look at the uh, uh, regulations uh, for GDP, for instance, uh, GDPR, and if uh, theories could be solutions, then uh, uh, and you put them in catalogs, uh, well. Uh, would it help to, to make uh, to, to share these solutions or have some common uh, common standards, common practices? Because I, I, they are all the same for for each university. And um, uh, do, do you are you already working towards that kind of solutions? You, you mean the like a principle that are common um, among different regulations? Well, what. I will, maybe in other words, uh, I see often that if you build a solution locally uh, and you want to collaborate with other universities, then you have to deal with uh, policies of the other in, uh, institutes as well. And then you, you may have a problem because your components are not fit to, to, to the, your other partners. So uh, uh, can, can, can you collaborate on that part and can SURF help? Uh, in, in establishing such uh, solutions? Um, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, or, 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 or are you just uh, at this point of time more focused on making a catalog and service portfolio for your own researchers? Or uh, is collaboration maybe the next step? Yeah, I, I think I think uh, yeah, that would be like a next level of our uh, like uh, in in DCC. At, at the moment, we like provide service for uh, for catalog for researchers. Yeah, and providing this kind of schema, this kind of uh, setup would be, I think, next step. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have another question coming in from Jan Reinders. Uh, the solutions presented are not cheap in terms of time and its resources. How are these solutions paid for? Um. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an interesting problem because especially services, when you talk about SLAs, it's something that you want to provide continuously. But 
research financing is often project-based, right? It's often for two years, three years, maybe five. So it's very hard to keep, um, especially domain-related repositories or, or other services that are up, uh, kept up by, by research groups themselves, to keep that continuously funded and, 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 and maintained. Um, so, yeah, there's a fundamental mismatch between research funding and uh, so the infrastructures that are need to be delivered for it. So, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated, yeah. I, I saw some reactions from the audience as well about the discussion about uh, uh, tailor-made uh, solutions and our uh, service portfolio. And Marta uh, had a, a comment about the... Uh, Oh, this is another question here. Yeah, some of um, this. For yeah, the, sorry, I, I get it here. The TCC at Two Delft is more about co-creation, co-developing with the research groups rather than providing a service. So uh, I think that's a different role, and that you uh, hinted on in, in, at first that it's uh, tailor-made. Yep. Um, maybe I can ask this to to Amir. Can you reflect to this uh, that it's more about co-creation uh, rather than providing services? Oh, absolutely. Uh, but, but what actually happening in Theodelf, uh, whenever we receive an application, we join the research group mm -hmm. and we try to develop a solution together. It's not that, like a uh, research group uh, give us like a, an assignment and we uh, do that for them. No. Uh, we, we, we provide a service, we develop the uh, service together. Mm -hmm. And we actually, uh, because we want this to be sustainable, we, we, we do not want when we leave the research group they, they don't uh, mm -hmm. they cannot uh, continue on that we, we want to enable them we want to create this competency mm -hmm. uh, in those research groups to be able to continue on a basis that we provided uh, during uh, like a six months that we spent with them yeah and and, and, and can you comment on um, well if, if you do uh, co-creation of course it uh, it comes more expensive uh, like like Jan uh, said um, do you have clear what kind of service you could offer as is and what kind of uh, service should be made in co-creation? This, this, uh, is there a uh, separation between them? Is, is there a part of the service you could make uh, more general available through uh, as an as is service to, to keep the costs lower or is it? I mean, we're, we're not providing our uh, container platform for our researchers, for example, and you see that containers have become very important in science because you can wrap a complete workflow or complete analysis in one neat package and you can basically deploy that anywhere. So then all we as the research support have to do is, is create a platform where you can, ser where you can run your containers yeah. on. And then that's a sort of perfect middle ground where everybody uh, you know, performs their own specialty and everybody gets what they want. So that's, I think, a nice level where um, it's something generic that you can facilitate, but at the same time a researcher can bring his or her own package uh, with an analysis in it um, and perform that. Uh, so, yeah, I think that could be very important uh, to support. Yeah, okay. Well, the, the last question, by the way, was from uh, Kees de Laat. He states that some services should just be basic services like telephone, uh, so it should go in the overhead, and that's well understood method. The same with RDM. And that may be uh, RDM is... Uh, uh, on, at the RDM infrastructure, we all uh, we also go to a, a basic standard solutions and infrastructure, and on, on top of it, uh, you, you make then this um, tailor-made solutions on top of this basic level. Yeah, I think so. Um, still, we do see a lot of protests if the overhead costs go up, right? So uh, it's, it's always a balancing act oh, yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah. How, how often do you see these tailor-made solutions uh, uh, made uh, uh, go to a basic service later on, or do you, will it mostly stay a tailor-made solution? I think with data management we're seeing now more and more that it becomes accepted that it should be there for everyone, whereas before it was just, uh, well, not a hobby, but mm -hmm. it was something that only a few groups did. So especially with data management, you see that moving now towards the generic space, I think. Um, another question from Chris. If I understand well, some DCC is about co-creation and a bit is in isolation. But where is then the role of SURF? Are some services bricks of the SURF portfolio used? Well, 
Uh, it's a good question. We, we want to reflect you, Amir, or do you want to say yeah, something about it? Yeah, basically what, uh, when we use service, when we want, uh, when we need like uh, technology, when we need like server, when we need like computational solution, when we need a uh, storage solution. And because Surf provide all these services in a very, uh, b b not in a costly manner, so basically that's uh, why Research Institute try to use uh, such uh, uh, solutions from Surf. Yeah. Basically. In this is. Okay, and, and if we go to the, this catalog, uh, catalog of all these useful services, uh, and uh, that, that could be something uh, on a national level uh, at, at SURF. Probably you heard of something like Research Cloud, which also offers uh, uh, the possibility to store your solutions in, in a sort of catalog and make them available. Um, I see here, it's not really a question, but more uh, uh, a comment from, from, from Marta that um, uh, empowering, empowering researchers uh, so that they continue sustain themselves, uh, can continue sustaining themselves solutions with work for them and their research groups. So, um, if you want to empower your research services, well, the time is very limited. So we, we cannot go to <laughs> another topic, uh, but uh, I would uh, would go to the topic of training, but uh, that's maybe for another session. Um, I think we have to round up this discussion now. Uh, uh, so I want to thank you, Eric, Edwin, and Amir for, for joining in this discussion, and of course you, the audience, for your questions. If there are any other questions raising uh, later on, well, please uh, uh, drop them uh, and we, we can uh, talk about it later because the discussion about research support has only just started. Mm -hmm.